Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today, I'm super excited because I get to speak with Jeff Golden. He is the author of a book called Reclaiming the Sacred, Healing Our Relationships with Ourselves and with the World. Jeff Golden has been teaching and writing about these topics for over 30 years, and most recently at Vassar College. He was a Fulbright Scholar in Sustainable Development and a recipient of the State Department's Millennium International Volunteer Award. He's a prison reform and animal rights activist and has headed several nonprofits promoting social justice, sustainability, and international education. As a native of Idaho, he resides in New York with his children, the river and the stars. He has headed several nonprofits promoting sustainability and international education. He was also the lead on the creation of the greenest certified building in New York State. He wrote a regular column as the green advocate for Upstate House Magazine, and he served as a liaison between uh, Monica Nation and Wisconsin and their homeland in what is today known as New York. He's the author of, as I stated, Reclaiming the Sacred, Healing Our Relationships with Ourself and the World. And of course, I will have all his information running across the screen, as well as his website, which is reclaimingthesacred.net. And also check the description below. I always put links to the author's um, website, as well as his book, and please feel free to leave any comments or questions below. I'm sure that Jeff will get to them at some point in time. Thank you so much. And now we welcome Jeff. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, I'm super excited because I have with us Jeff Golden. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Today, we're going to be discussing a lot of topics pertaining to his book, Reclaiming the Sacred, healing our relationships with ourself and the world. And of course, I will have all the links running across the screen, as I mentioned earlier. And also in the description of this video, there'll be a link to Jeff's website, as well as a link to where you can purchase his book. Jeff, I read your book. I thought it was amazing. It's the kind of book you got to read twice. It's packed with so much information. So I'm like underlining and doing all this great stuff. And I have every intention of rereading it. But thank you again for joining us. So, so tell us a little bit about yourself, of course, so folks know you have quite the background. So I, first of all, I want to say I'm honored and delighted to be here. I'm glad we were able to make it work. And that's a wonderful thing that you were able to read the whole book because I do talk with a lot of people and I don't always make an assumption about how much someone is able to read, you know, what different sections they get to. So that's really sweet. And I'm glad you were able to have the time for that. Of course. I spent over 10 years researching and writing that book. And I have a background that spans a whole lot of the different areas that are covered in the book. But something that I like to emphasize is that there are over 2,000 citations in the back of this book. So when someone picks up this book, or here I am talking with you, it really is not just me, but there are thousands of other people joining me here because woven throughout the book, of course, is my own voice, my own values and experiences. But really, it's rooted in this research and the writings of so many other people. And that's part of why it took more than 10 years to bring out and to give birth to in this way. Previously, I have written about sustainability. I used to write a monthly column about environmental sustainability. I have headed several different nonprofits. My background is much more related to education and personal growth. And through these 10 years uh, of this project of researching and writing this book, I got to become very familiar with some of the details of things that I had been myself living and working on and trying to educate people about and just got to dive so deep with it and see in the nitty gritty what people really are saying and discovering about all of this. Uh, yeah, as I as I mentioned, it's it's uh, it's pretty comprehensive. There's so much like we could have several 
of these calls and still not get through a lot of the context in the book. But I picked some questions that I thought would interest um, people and kind of pertinent to the world we live in today. So tell us first, what was the driving force? Because I always like to ask uh, authors that, like what made you sit down and decide, I, I have to write this book for folks and, and like, what was the driving force behind it? Yeah. I love, I love going back and thinking about this, talking about it. There are several different ways I could answer it, but the one that I feel moved to speak to right now is really in a deep and true sense. This felt like a calling for me. I had never planned on being an author. I had done some writing before, but writing a book wasn't on that bucket list of things that I needed to do or felt essential to my purpose in this life. I've really taken my life step by step, month by month, year by year, following a lot of different paths based on what feels like what I'm supposed to be doing at this time, where the, the feeling takes me in a sense, my head as much as my heart. And it was a series of coincidences really that put me in touch with another book that I was very impressed by by and it came at a particular time in my life the title of the book actually was skinny bitch it was a new york times bestseller it was written by two former models and it's packaged as this book about really how to sort of look and and be vibrant and beautiful and healthy but i knew behind the scenes i'd heard about the book because both of those authors are vegetarian and have done a lot of work around animal rights something that i care a lot about so when this book serendipitously showed up at my home one day, I thought, well, I owe it to these people and myself to just see what this book is about. I opened it up. I was amazed at both how thoughtful and funny the writers were, but also their descriptions of some of the things happening in the world, especially around the way some animals are treated, was honestly as graphic as anything that I've seen. And most people really don't want to hear about that. I mean, people who even really care about animals and the well-being of other creatures tend to shy from wanting to actually be up close with some of what's going on, right? And yet here these two women had done that and it was a New York Times bestseller. Like I said, it came at a particular juncture in my life where it just struck me that I felt like I could write a similar kind of book, but maybe with each chapter being one of the maybe 10 most significant issues of our times. And just in a light but you know, hard hitting way, introduce people to these. That is not the book I ended up writing. Where I went with that was in the very first chapter, it was clear to me that in order to really enter and make any a difference, kind of a difference on any of these issues, we have to look at the relationship between money and happiness. Because in almost every single one of these issues, the driving force is people wanting more money and more possessions. And so I had a general sense that there was a, a limited connection between our well-being and possessions and money. But the first chapter was really about diving deep and looking at what does the research say. And as it turns out, 10 years later, that was largely the book. It was largely flipped on its head. There's one section that does walk through some of the major issues at this time and ties them back to money and consumption and production. But really, ultimately, what came alive for me was this journey of, looking at what does it mean to live a rich life connected with each other, with the world, with our own hearts and spirits in a way that's really meaningful, moving. And where's the disconnect between that and how most of us are living in terms of the importance that we give to money and possessions? So much importance that we often sacrifice huge parts of our own lives and our own well-being. But of course, obviously, we consistently do this with other people and creatures as well. We continually are out there causing a significant amount of violence and destruction through our consumption, all in the pursuit of more money. And where has it gotten us? And so the book is really a research and sort of academic, like rigorously look at, at well, what do we really know about this? And as you know from your own read, it also goes beyond that and says, what would it look like? What would it feel like to leave all of that behind and step into what really perhaps is our deepest calling? What really can nourish us the most in our own lives? Gosh, that was so beautifully stated. There's so many things that I, I can ask you just in that two minutes. And I do want to talk about the animal thing, the animal rights thing as well at some point with you. Um, but... I, 
some of my questions, of course, did revolve around and do revolve around happiness and money. And I have talked to other great authors about happiness and how people are so seem so much more unhappy now more than ever. And I, I the first question I wanted to ask you though was regarding poverty. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, clearly, and as you clearly state in your book, there's a global problem. What is it, like 70% of the planet is, is poverty stricken, something I can't Living remember. Living in some degree of poverty, right? Right. So I wanted to ask you about that because yeah. um, do you think ever that, the, because I remember that problem as a child being, you know, brought up and, and ha- hearing adults talk about it. And till today, it doesn't seem like, well, we have made strides, I, I do believe. But do you think that poverty will ever, the problem of poverty will ever be solved? If so, what's your vision for that to happen? I love that question. I'm going to offer a little context and try not to get lost in the context and miss yeah. the actual answer. But for people listening who haven't read any of the book, aren't familiar with some of the basic findings that I cover in there, One of the central ideas that helps drive the book forward is that since at least the 1940s, the average level of happiness in the United States has been in a consistent decline. You said that you feel like you see that around you, and it bears out in terms of the research. It's not a huge decline by some measures, but it's consistent even through areas areas of, um, I mean to say, eras of significant economic growth. Now, why this is so striking and significant, since the 1940s, the financial and material gains that have been made in this country are absolutely staggering. People in the 1940s, a large portion of them, didn't have indoor plumbing, not to mention the size of houses, the cars, the gadgets, the incomes that the average person in the United States has today. And yet, our happiness has gone down. Why is that? Overall, it's been found that happiness only, I'm sorry, that money and possessions only account for about two to 4% of our happiness. Where money does its really heavy lifting is when we are living in poverty. If we are not able to meet our basic needs, then additional money that allows us to get more food, shelter, that kind of security makes a significant difference to our well being. But once we're able to meet our basic needs, The research shows that consistently additional money makes almost no difference to our happiness. And quite often, the pursuit of money and further possessions actually undermines our well-being. To underscore this, there was a, a, a striking study done that looked at homeless people in the United States and homeless people in Calcutta, India. What they found was that despite the people in Calcutta living in much greater poverty in terms of what they were subjected to, much less access to food, shelter, health care. They were overall happier than the homeless people in the United States. What the researchers discovered was the significant difference between those two groups of people was that the people in Calcutta had generally been able to maintain some kind of relationship with their friends and family that the people in the United States the homeless people in Oregon actually cited as the number one thing they missed the most was these kinds of relationships, more than steady shelter or food. So it's an example of the fact that even when we are living in poverty, there are other factors that are actually still more significant. And we could talk a lot about what those are, but to answer your question, one of the I think most painful and striking things about poverty and so many of the problems in the world today is how unnecessary they really are. It boils down to a sort of worldview that is um, what they call zero sum. You know, in order for me to benefit or live well, someone else has to go without. When what the research shows, the reality is that it's exactly the opposite, that we have such an abundance in this world. We have more than enough that every person on this planet right now could live a meaningful life in terms of meeting all of their basic needs, as well as a little bit beyond that. But that's not the world that we've chosen for ourselves. Again, partly through misconceptions, partly because you know the average person doesn't have a whole lot of power on those things. Um, 
And so actually part of my hope in writing this book and part of my own gesture into the world, my own gift during my lifetime is trying to help enlighten people around that disconnect between money and well-being because with that awareness comes a liberation we are then free in many ways to pursue the lives that we really feel called to, drawn to, that really will reward us, and that will allow others to live those kinds of lives as well. There's a bumper sticker sometimes you might see on, on cars. I've seen it a few times. This is something like, live simply that others may simply live. And it's fundamentally true, but also beyond that, it's not just about live simply. Live simply and richly. It's a gift to us through simple living as well as a gift to other people as well. Now, will we resolve poverty during my lifetime? I'm not going to bet I'm not going to bet a whole lot on that just given the way that power and economics are being held in the world right now. But I think that big strides are already being made and the opportunities that exist we don't need to change entire systems or even the thinking of a lot of the richest people in the world. If a, if a number of us just keep doing the things that we're doing now of helping to make the changes on a smaller scale and reinvesting our own money to help other people, it's making a huge difference already. So I'd like to think that at least during my lifetime, we'll continue to see advances made in that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's a lot of charitable people that do, do a lot of good too. It, I just think that right now, without getting political, it's very difficult for people to even want to enrich their lives with luxuries when they can't even afford to, to pay rent. I mean, you know what's yeah. going on economically in our country yeah. and globally as yeah. well. Yes. So it's it's kind of sad, you know, where now we're worried about buying food. It seems to be more of an issue than getting that Nintendo game or Wii game for your child. Yes, I think some huge changes would be in order and would really benefit all of us. The other piece, though, that's important to keep in mind is that even while many of us are living in situations where we don't have a lot of choice about what we need to do to just meet our basic needs, at the same time, a lot of us really do buy into this overall paradigm of more in terms of money and stuff equals better living. And a lot of us actually do have choices, even if they're smaller ones, about how we're spending our time, whether we're spending it with friends and family, with our own children, for example, or whether we're out there trying to make that additional buck. So I want to hold both of those as true, have the empathy of really understanding that for a lot of people, we're really just doing everything we can to just stay above water. And at the same time, also to recognize that a lot of us just keep biting off more than we need to in terms of money and stuff. And that again, and even for those of us who are lower income, even living in poverty, as I mentioned, there are still other factors that matter more for our own well-being and for our children's well-being. And so to at least hold that in perspective at the same time. Yeah, I mean, look at what is being pushed in our faces every day in terms of you know, and you hear people like, um, what's his name from the WEF? Yuval Harare. I always say his name. I don't wrong. know. I oh, don't my know. word. <laughs> you should check him out sometime because he says, uh, and that's going along with the premise that that whole organization says, you will own nothing and be happy. I'm sure you've heard that. Oh. Have you heard that? I haven't, I haven't, but that's well, powerful. yeah, you should check it out. Like if you I mean it sounds good on its face, but it's very nefarious behind yeah. it. But I don't want to get into the whole politics of that. But people like Yuvel say, say things like that in, in terms of creating a new world order, they want to keep us uh drugged with uh video games, entertainment, things like that, you know, sports yeah. and um, that's like the main premise behind it. I think this push that yeah. these things will make us happy. So, and, and interestingly, yeah. I think people are discovering now more than I've ever seen in my lifetime, that there's this global awakening taking place at the same time where a lot of people are realizing that these materialistic goods are not the root or the road 
to happiness. And a lot of people are discovering that. Have you noticed that since you wrote your book? Absolutely. I mean, the proof is in the pudding about that disconnect between money and well-being. I already mentioned that general statistic about the United States happiness being in a consistent decline, but we have a lot of other statistical proof too. People feel more alone, more insecure than ever before. One in 25 people in the United States every year seriously considers suicide. That's That's an incredibly damning statement for a country that has led the world in terms of financial and material wealth. And certainly a large part of that has to do with the fact that material and financial wealth are not what make for an actually rich life. But there's that other piece as well that you sort of were alluding to, which is that when when you have a lot of that wealth being held by a very few number of people who arguably have done very little to actually be worthy of that, or in fact have often done things that are hurtful to other people and the planet and you have so many people going without that's a recipe for some of the things that we're talking about and i do think that a lot of people even as we have all of these cultural messages coming at us about just more and more money and stuff are the path to happiness and our our, our purpose a lot of people increasingly are just turning away from that and finding ways that they can nourish the things that they really care about despite those messages and despite everything that we're all caught up in here. So on a consciousness level, like how do you think, if you look at like Maslow's hierarchy, right? You need to have all your basic needs met before you can attain like a higher spiritual level, right? Right. How are people supposed Go ahead. You want to say something? Well, I love it because because first of all, something that that Maslow's hierarchy, based on how many people think about it, is not true in terms of what this research says. And and that example I gave earlier is just one of those that actually ultimately our well being is determined by many factors, a lot of which are completely independent of some of those material needs, and oftentimes which are. St- still even more important, even when we aren't able to meet some of those basic needs like food and shelter. And just to give him some credit, Maslow didn't actually ever say that it was a hierarchy where you have to meet this one in order to go to the next. He was simply presenting it as sort of a hierarchy of different needs that actually could be attained in different orders. So I just like to put that out there. No, I'm glad you did. I'm glad. Yeah. So how do you think though? Well, I guess if you look at a a country that has a lot of poverty. I'm sure there are people that struggle to find food and shelter every day, and they're still very spiritually enlightened, correct? True. And a lot of them are actually very happy. Without, though, romanticizing poverty, right? I mean, a lot of us, a lot of people who are listening right now have themselves experienced a certain degree of poverty, I'm sure, whether that's homelessness or not having enough food, not knowing how you're going to just meet meet ends, you know, the next month, depending on what's going on in your life. And poverty does have a significant impact on our lives, besides some of those obvious baseline things about having enough food and enough shelter. You know, when you're living in poverty, you tend to be subjected more to crime. You tend to be disempowered more from the political system, all of these things. So I want to first be clear that I'm not trying to romanticize poverty. But at the same time, what you're saying is true, that we also need to be really careful around romanticizing material wealth in a way that we have done, particularly here in the United States, and set that up as the end-all be-all of what's going to make us happy and what's going to make us successful as a society, when by so many measures, we're dramatically failing as a society, despite the fact that we still have a lot of these options laid out before us of different possibilities going forward. Well, how are folks supposed to, though, not put their financial well-being as a primary indicator to their happiness when they're being charged $3,000 a month for a one-bedroom apartment? Like, how how are people supposed to negotiate that? It makes no sense to me. I hear that. I absolutely hear that. And again, I think I want to say that on the one hand, the answer is sometimes there isn't a lot you can do. We're all just doing our best given the circumstances around us. And I would urge everyone out there at the same time to notice the decisions that they're making in their own lives. If they are really in that $3,000 a month 
one bedroom apartment and that's just the cost of living where they are, then they're going to have to muscle through that as best they can, right? But a lot of people, like I said, tend to overreach, tend to try and take on try to take on more home than they need, more of a, say like a rich neighborhood than they need, more car or cars than they need, more gadgets in terms of clothing, the brands of clothing. On all fronts, we tend to overreach in the society because that's the message is that that's where success is. That's how we prove to ourselves and others that we're really making it. You know, one of the critical decision points that comes in many people's lives is where do you want to live? And that right there has huge consequences, not only because to a certain degree, you're locking yourself into a certain cost of living, right? But also because your expectations for yourself and for, say, your family, for your kids, if you have kids, are set by the people around you. And so all of a sudden, you're not just locking yourself into whatever the cost of living is of that apartment or home that you're in, but a certain way of life that all of a sudden you and your kids are going to expect around what's normal when truly in the global perspective what's normal is nothing like what most americans ever experience right most people throughout the world will never achieve the kind of material well-being that we have here in the united states and the kinds of things that well i should cite one more one more example of from the research which is that the more money and possessions that we have the less we tend to be able to savor life's simple pleasures and the more fleeting our joy is. It's kind of like we keep ratcheting up the bar for what kind of stimulation we need to keep us engaged and happy. Whereas the reverse, playing a sort of reverse game, there are tremendous rewards in slowing down and instead turning our attention in a direction of sort of gratitude and noticing all of the things that we do actually have I like to suggest to people that anytime you're you're feeling like there's something you want to buy or need to buy, or you're worried about losing something, again, I'm not saying that there isn't some pain and loss and all of that, but take a moment and instead of focusing on what you don't have, just for a moment, breathe in, slow down, and notice everything that you do have, because every one of us was born into this world of, I shouldn't say every one of us. Almost everyone is born into this world of light and color and music, sounds, movement, sight, air, water. Some of the most basic things that are so deeply satisfying to someone who just slows down and is present to them, drinking water, eating food. These kinds of gifts are present in most of our lives. For many of us, they're lost in the background noise of that hustle of where our attention is of trying to get more. So once again, I'm kind of saying it's both and I have tremendous sympathy for the person who's trying to just make ends meet and has no choice about the cost of living. And in fact, how sort of maybe minimalist their lifestyle is without a choice, right? It shouldn't be that way in one of the richest countries on the planet. That's my opinion. I don't think we gain anything from that kind of massive division of, of the wealth of this country. And even for those of us who maybe are on that end of the spectrum, whether you have tons of money or very little money, we actually, a lot of the time, still have an opportunity to pick our focus, where we focus our attention, how we feel in our lives. Is the glass half full or is it half empty? Because objectively speaking, they can both be true, but which one do you want to shape how you see the world and how you interact with other people and how you feel? Especially when, for most of us, the glass isn't just half full. Most of us, the glass is 99% full with wonder right. and so many miracles and gifts, right? But that we can increasingly lose sight of. That's so true. But but again, I, I, I think a lot of it is, is what's being pushed at us through social media, technology, and people just trying to like, think of how many people take jobs that they hate because they have to, they have to feed their kids, pay the bills. So where is happiness for these folks that, like I did it myself. I worked uh, in New York City for many years, commuting yeah. from Pennsylvania to New York, two hours each way. And in the beginning I was like, just miserable. And then I finally just zend it out. And I, I said, this is the path I chose. And yeah. But still, it's filled with a lot of unhappiness. So what do you recommend for folks yeah. that 
um, are unhappy because they have to be kind of unhappy. Right. Well, first, I want to emphasize again that what researchers have found is that if you ask people how much money they think they need to just be happy and secure, no matter how much money they have, even millionaires who are asked this question, it is consistently more than they have, anywhere from 25% more, 50% more, twice as much. So it does speak again to being careful to not get too caught up in that trap of always biting off more and thinking this is the path to success, right? Recognizing that even right now, I think 10% more income would just make life so much more comfortable and easy for me. But if I just take a moment and acknowledge that, okay, everyone else who's already just made that step says they need 10% more. And everyone at the next level up is saying the same thing. At what point do we shake our heads and say, oh my God, how much is enough? When the research says, I need to just meet my basic needs at a very simple level, and beyond that, more money is not going to make me happier. Maybe we need to reevaluate how we're focusing and the things that we are biting off, right? At the same time, again, I'm going to say that for people who are caught in a very difficult situation, I'm going to be the last one who's like saying, you should just be happy, you know, mm -hmm. or this should just resolve easily. It may not. But what I do want to do is highlight six or seven of the factors that it's been determined really do drive our well-being so that it's not just being caught up over here, but people can have a sense of some of the alternatives as well. I think of these, as you know, from the book in two different categories. One is sort of the world around us and the lives that we create. And the other is our inner worlds. And with regards to our outer worlds, these are things like the kind of work we do, the number of hours we're working, the optimal number of hours to be working seems to be about eight hours a week. That's not saying how much do you need to work to pay your bills. It's saying if you can pay your bills, what's the optimal level of work to be happy? Eight hours. The more people work beyond that, the less happy that they tend to be. Wow. It's things like our physical well-being and our health. It's things as simple as getting enough sleep. One of the most important factors in terms of our outer worlds is the amount of time that we spend with friends and family, the number of people that we have that we feel like really know us and we can call on in times of need. Those are the things that really nourish a sense of well-being and joy, a sense of comfort and ease in our lives. Ultimately, though, the most significant factors are the internal ones. These have to do with, again, that a number of different things, but that sense of, is the glass half full or half empty? In some ways, that kind of captures a lot of it. Um, there are maybe four different categories that I'll just name really quickly, and we can talk about any of them. Or, But one is, how comfortable are you with different emotions, and how do you relate to difficult situations? We have sort of a hardwired system of emotions, this profound wisdom for how to move through life successfully that's been bequeathed to us by millions and billions of years of our ancestors, right? And yet many of us, especially in this culture in the United States, we try to push those emotions down, feelings of sadness, angst, those kinds of things. And yet the research shows that, yes, we tend to be happier when we're experiencing like happy emotions, but overall, the happiest people are those who allow themselves to experience a range of emotions, even for a while experiencing, yes, grief when there's loss in your life. Yes, sadness, to let those feelings come and move with them. Another one is our relationship with ourselves. This is arguably the most significant one. So many of us have internalized negative messages about ourselves, like oftentimes when we were kids things that adults said to us or other kids. And those often live on in us and they have a significant yeah. impact on how we feel, how we interact with each other, what we show of ourselves, what we don't, how we hide. I mean, there are a lot of different ways that that shows up. And then I think the other one I'd highlight is again about that sense of the glass being half full, living with a, a degree of presence just having some time, being able to feel and think and be, and to appreciate gratitude is an immense gift that nourishes tremendous well-being. And people who do even simple activities like maybe at the end of 
the day noting three wonderful things that you saw in today in the world that happened to you or someone else, or maybe a weekly journaling around the things that you're grateful for. These kinds of things have been shown to have an impact on our happiness that is much stronger and much longer lived than anything like a raise at work. Yeah, okay. Again, just some quick glimpses. Yeah. Gratitude, especially like I, I try to start every day and end every day with some form of gratitude. Um, why do you think, though, that I'd say it, especially in the past five years, this whole thing about feelings has risen to the surface, meaning that I was raised with just because you think it or feel it doesn't mean you need to say it. So, but nowadays it's yeah. like people are just blurting out, you know, their feelings to a point where it's getting in the way of everything, especially in the political arena. What do you think accounts for this extreme in being raised with keep like Spock, you know, keep your feelings, yeah. your emotions at bay. Now everyone is like this emotion bomb that they they're just blurting and screaming out at everybody. What do you think is accounting for that? Well, I have to say that I don't know that I've seen what you're describing. I think that definitely there's a uh, politics of anger and people acting out in ways that are really vicious um, towards other people. But I would say, and again, in the business realm and especially in the political realm, there's almost no room for sadness. I mean, if someone cries publicly, a politician, I mean, first of all, men are so deeply conditioned. It's very yeah. rare that a man does that. And if a woman does that, then she gets punished, right? Because look at how emotional she is. Right. And that's from, that would be from just a very basic human and vital response to so much of what's really happening in our world, right? I mean, I... I would encourage us to lean much more in the direction of the way that children handle their emotions, which is to say, they don't sit there and evaluate, oh, am I am I worthy enough of crying right now? Or is this important enough? Like kids, if something happens and comes at them and they feel it, they do express it. They let it move through their body. I'm not saying that we should all just behave like children, right? But I'm saying compared to what we're doing now, I think a huge corrective in that direction would be in order. And let's just take, for example, a politician. The kinds of things that politicians have to discuss, the interactions that they have, the stories that they hear, I mean, some of it's a lot of just political crap, right, that they have to deal with, but it's also humanity. And even I think the most crass of politicians, what they're encountering are people who are facing tremendous needs, who are suffering awful experiences sometimes, people who need some kind of change. They need this to be addressed. And most politicians, the reaction in that moment of hearing this story is so rarely one of tears and just being present as a human being, right? So I'm just saying from my perspective, I actually don't see a lot of the sort of emotional responses or outlets that you're describing. Oh, uh, I do. But but All again, in terms of the political media. realm and business and yeah, maybe I mean, not interesting. In business. Yeah, or in politics, or honestly, just in my life, I feel like, and, and, and this is in my courses that I teach, where we do a lot of work about connecting with our emotions and a lot of the things that we've internalized. It's a lot of work for people to actually just let themselves feel some sadness and really express some grief about loss in their lives or about yeah. the state of the world, things like that. You know? I mean, I, I agree with that, but I think I think it's a lot of what I see is anger on social media. Um I mean, even if you look at Madonna, she said a few years ago when Trump was president that she, I don't know if you heard her say it. Did did you happen to hear? Well, she's a very famous individual, millions yeah. and millions of people. Yeah. And she made a statement that was, I, I really can't repeat because huh. I don't want the video to get flagged, but yeah. she made a really bad statement about the White House and what she would like to do to it. Let's just yeah. put it that way. Right. I mean, right. I, I might have her quote running across the screen at some point. Yeah, but I hear you. I, I'm seeing a lot of that where yeah. the rage is like surface to the top. You see so yeah. many 
videos of, you know, Gen Xers screaming and yelling about the state of the economy, how they can't pay their bills and they're yeah. making these TikTok videos and whatnot. So yeah. I'm seeing a lot of it there. Yeah, and I guess it right. is anger. Right. And maybe, you know, and, and what you just described, for example, with the economic situation of Gen Xers, like maybe a lot of that is justified, you know, and maybe that's good that people are channeling their anger. Yeah. But at the end of the day, a lot of, and this is, again, social science research, there's one researcher, an expert on violence, who has suggested that ultimately every form of violence against other people or against ourselves comes down to shame. That is to say, these mm -hmm. deeply embedded senses that we've internalized of things that are wrong with us. I think maybe another way of thinking about it is that when there's something that we deeply want and are not getting it, the way we respond oftentimes is with anger and oftentimes with violence. Sometimes it's simply, if I can't have it, you can't have it, right? right? A lot of times though, it's deeper than that. It's like a lot of us have grown up in a culture that was prioritizing money and stuff and there wasn't a whole lot of time or attention or love. I mean, not to mention actually being allowed to feel our emotions, as you mentioned, right? Like Dr. Spock raising and things like that. And what does it do to a human being when their own humanity, when their very heart, when their joy keeps being boxed up and denied? And I think, I mean, the research on materialism speaks very clearly to this. The more that we put an importance on money and stuff, is a clear indication of a lack of something that really does matter in our lives. Because again, the money and possessions don't buy us well-being, generally speaking, except in, you know, like I said, in the most dire of circumstances, generally speaking. And yet consistently then, how does money hook us? So often what it has to do with is us trying to either distract ourselves or prove to ourselves or other people around these things that we actually are lacking, which is a sense of worthiness, a sense of That's connection true. with the world and other people, having just some spaciousness, feeling a fundamental sense of respect and dignity in ourselves. For so many of us, that is something that is not just handed out in, in abundance daily. Like we rarely are handed respect, dignity, a profound sense of just honoring the beauty of you and your humanness, right? That is not the state of the world for most of us. And the ways we respond to our humanity, our love, our needs being denied, us being held under the heel of someone else is so often a striking back, right? It's a resentment Gosh, that can channel so in lots true. of different ways. That's so true. We were taught to, to not show our vulnerability, right? So therefore, you know, all the showing emotions get you mocked. Like you said, people will mock you. But yet when people make videos on the Internet, they get millions of views. I mean, I, I could think of several off the top of my head of people showing yeah. their vulnerability. What do you think accounts for that now? Do you think that how do you do that without mm -hmm. being angry, too? How do you show your emotions without letting that anger rise to the surface? Well, I mean, I would first of all say that anger is actually a vital and important emotion to be felt as well. But what I hear, I think you describing is when that's what takes over and that's what carries yeah. everything away, right? I mean, I'm going to direct people to there are a couple of videos, TED Talks that Brene Brown did okay. that are specifically on the topic of vulnerability that I think are beautiful, especially as a starting point. There's lots more that we could go into beyond that. But what she emphasizes, and maybe I'll go ahead and put this in, these, this in my own words, is that consistently everyone, the research shows this, at least within this culture, we are carrying deeply embedded negative messages about ourselves. This is the truth of every single person that you encounter, no matter what image they're putting forward walking down the street or on social media, right? To the degree that we are moving through a process of healing, we're acknowledging that, we're seeing that I feel these things. I mean, in my book, I list these, but I'll just name a few of them right here. I go through these with, in my course with my, with my students and the participants in my online course. I mean, I grew up feeling um, really inadequate as, for example, as a man, I didn't date someone until after high school, really. I didn't have sex until I was 20 or 21. 
which statistically is increasingly a norm, but I didn't feel that way. Um, I felt completely inadequate. I was really skinny, still very skinny, but I was super skinny as a teenager. A deeply embedded sense of like feeling not attractive on that front. Um, I also, I didn't drink or do drugs in high school or college. And looking back, I'm like, thank goodness. And so many of the people that were, yeah. the stories they have to say are not positive, but I nonetheless was raised in a culture where a lot of the media around me, movies and the other kids, the expectation was that is what you're doing if you are sort of an attractive or popular person. I'm saying this really quickly, but just slow it down for a moment, acknowledge what I'm naming right now for you are those things that I would never have wanted anyone to think or see about me. I would cover up. I would try not to talk about them or let other people see them. It's only 20 years of a lot of work that's gotten me to the place where I can be like, oh, either those aren't true or they are true. And thank goodness, like the fact that I am such a sensitive human being, that used to be a source of tremendous shame for me especially as a man, and I think especially in this culture. And yet now I consider that like, like perhaps my single greatest superpower, like my sensitivity. So I just name this because if there are people online who are actually opening and being vulnerable about some of the shameful experiences they've had, some of the negative things that they think about themselves, some of us, that voice is strong and constant, just always putting us down. If there are people giving voice to that, that's a healing journey. And if there are people, millions of people who are watching that and celebrating it, then I think that's a wonderful use of social media. When it flips and what you have is people just like grabbing for their chunk of attention, right? Mm -hmm. Then that actually is a manifestation of something that's not very healthy for them or the people who are glomming on to that. Or if they're channeling it in ways that are just insulting to other people that are angry and demeaning to other people. Again, to me, that's a really clear sign that that person themselves is lacking in something pretty fundamental. And they and the people around them should be taking better care of themselves and nourishing their own well-being to get into a little bit more balance in a place where they can be generous and kind and empathetic. I really like that. How do you battle negative self-talk? What would you recommend because I think that's a big problem today. And you mentioned that in your book as well. So if you could kind of give us some sage advice, that would be wonderful. I would be delighted to, at least again, to point the direction, right? Um, I mean, I do teach an online course that's by donation and is available to anyone online who wants to participate. So I'm going to go ahead and just put that out there that it's six weeks, two hours each week, anyone who wants to look me up and participate in that. This is a large part of the journey of what we do in that course. There are three real paths in terms of how we can heal these places and maybe quiet those voices a little bit and amplify the voices of celebration, right? And acknowledging, I'm actually wonderful. I'm beautiful. I'm brilliant. This world is beautiful and brilliant. And one of those paths is, one of them is transcendence, to transcend them. Some of us have experiences, whether it's religious or being in nature. Some people it's um, in ceremonies like using mushrooms or things like that. But um, whatever it is, there are the, these, these are those times where you don't feel those things, where that voice is just gone. You just dropped right beneath all of that. And you're just living in a truth of wonder that is just undeniable, right? This is the most wonderful way to get past that voice is to just be able to disregard it, drop beyond it, and just be in the truth of who you really are. Some people, you're lying under the stars and it comes to you. Some people listening to music, making love. It can be in any number of ways. But what the research also suggests is that generally that isn't enough. You also need the second path, which is the path of transformation. And that's what I was referring to where I talked about, first of all, just coming to acknowledge those voices and those negative messages to even admit to ourselves that that exists within us. Sometimes the word shame originally comes from a word that meant to hide, not just because we hide it from other people, but we stow that stuff far away from ourselves too, because it's sometimes just excruciating. Things that were done to us, things that we did, things that we just feel are wrong with us or not good enough. It's acknowledging them 
And over time, it can be a different path. It can be talking about it with just a good friend, just being like, you know, something that I've just always thought about myself. It's just a sharing. For, for many people, therapy is really powerful. For some people, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, or like a religious counselor, there are lots of different paths. But to follow a path where what we do is draw a little bit closer to those and look at them. For example, well, where did that message originally come from? I mean, sometimes we'll realize, oh my gosh, you suddenly remember who said that to me? And you look at them and you're like, that's the person that is telling me, I'm going to give one example. For example, um, you know, what's his name? The, the movie director, the big movie mogul who was brought down by the Me Too movement, who had been sexually abusive of so many women. Oh, why you're talking about? Thank you. Yes. This was the man making movies that I was watching as a kid that shaped my sense of relationships and what it means to be a man, right? Him and all these other men were making these movies. Oh my God, that's the man who's sitting here in my head. I didn't know it was his voice, but he's the one telling me that I'm not enough of a man because I'm not having a certain kind of interaction with women when I'm a teenager and into college, right? That's just one example. Sometimes we look at them and we it could be a parent. We recognize, oh my God, of course they said that to me. They were in so much pain themselves, right? Like they had they had such a hard life. They were abused, things like that. We can start to recognize where those messages came from. Sometimes we recognize that, yeah, I actually am still really skinny, but I'm not as skinny as I used to be. And there's a disconnect between how I'm seeing myself and the reality. Sometimes what we start to recognize is that another thing that happened to me, one of those shames that I list for me is that I was bullied as a child in like early elementary and then again in middle school some. That again, deeply impacted my sense of, well, I'm such an inadequate boy slash man. I'm not, you know, I, I need to be strong. I need to at least fight back. I didn't do those things. And over time, I've been able to, through reflecting on it, not by keeping it locked away and at a distance, but by drawing a little bit closer to it, talking about it, reflecting on it, I've come to recognize that when I see a child who is treated that way today, I do not think less of them. I only hope that they find safety, that there's some kind of uh, addressing of this violence that's going on. For me, there's almost nothing that I'm thinking about that child that's in any way negative, right? And so I can take that and be like, wow, maybe that, that's true for me as well, you know? And I have gotten affirmations from other people who are just so loving and empathetic towards me and not just sort of like, oh, you were bullied? Wow, you know, like, and distance or shame kinds of things. So I'll just say quickly, the, the third path I think is one of, um, and what's the word, adaptation, which is to say for a lot of us, maybe all of us, some of this, these negative emotions, the, that voice aren't ever going to fully go away. And so there's a way that we can be gentle and accepting with ourselves. For example, I might say that if I'm going to be in a certain circumstance, I'm going to want to make sure that like, my partner is close at hand or something like that, or I'm going to avoid certain situations that are just hurtful for me. Maybe I'm going to share some of these stories with, say, my partner, with the love of my life, right? So that she knows these things about me, so that she can be supportive. And she can also be aware that certain kinds of words or stories or something might be a little bit hard for me, those kinds of things, you know? So, so it's about the transcendence, just going beyond them, taking the time for, to be in the journey of transformation, which is a long and slow, but deeply rewarding journey and sort of acceptance slash adaptation to acknowledge that I have some of these things, some of these triggers, for example, and how can I be gentle with myself around them? I love that. What you said about looking at the person who's telling you this stuff in the first place and saying, you know, having that realization, like, wow, I let that person bully me into thinking yeah. I was X, Y, Z, whatever. That's really yeah. a, a great example. Like take a look at the, the person telling you this stuff. Right. For so many of us, it's like, oh, that was a second grader. <laughs> and we were in a second grade class where their entire sense of the world and themselves was this big, right? Right, and, right. and yet, oh my God, what that person said has lived within me all these years. And I could walk into a room and immediately assume that that's how people are seeing me before they've even said a word and then recognize 
that's from second grade and from that one second grader i just made that one up but just as an example right, yeah right. i think it's really powerful great i also wanted to to get to you on the topic of of animal wellness and and just cruelty to animals in general. Yeah. I, I know that's dear to your heart, as you mentioned yeah. earlier, and it is to mine too. But I think I think a big struggle for many of us animal lovers is the decision to eat meat or not eat meat. And I wanted to touch upon that because I know a lot of people that um, are animal lovers and they just will not, they're vegetarians or vegan. Yeah, yeah. And then there's people like myself that I eat very limited amounts of meat yeah. Um, very limited amounts, but I still do eat meat Yeah. because of the protein factor and I don't like fish. So it gets a little worrisome for people like me that need to eat meat for protein. Yeah. Where does that, we have so much to worry about. Like yeah. th there's so much happening in our globe right now. Yeah. And we want to, to be concerned for animals and take the best care of them. I mean, I have a dog that is like a son to me in every way, shape and form. I've always had dogs, love animals. Yeah. yeah. How do we, how do we tackle this? I mean, I'm sure yeah. you're a vegetarian, right? Excuse me. I'm for a vegetarian. Me. Right. I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been mostly vegan for a long time now. And that's certainly a possibility as you mentioned. And you know, what I was thinking as you were asking that, I was like, what if the animals were here with us right now and had voices, voices that we could, access and understand i i know someone who runs an animal sanctuary who's very clear that animals communicate very oh, clearly about right but in a way that what would they <laughs> say the answer is here the answer would probably be a little bit more extreme than you or i would want to hear they would probably draw a much harder line than what i'm going to draw but for me i think nothing is gained from just feeling guilt and a weight around this stuff and feeling like i'm not doing enough right mm -hmm. right I think that whether it's about eating animals or whether it's about all kinds of consumption, so many of which are tied with some kind of violence or destruction in the world, and especially these days with global warming, as everything we're doing consumption-wise is feeding this violence, the answer, I think, is much less in the all or nothing than it is in the take some steps in that direction. Mm. Most people who I know who really care about animal rights are going to encourage people to move as far as they can in that direction. But I think consistently what's right, what's really important and right in front of us is just take one step. So for some people that's, well, m make one meal a week, meat free, mm -hmm. just see what that's like for you. For a lot of people, that right there is going to be huge and maybe is going to be really important in terms of their own health and feeling like, yes, I'm contributing something. Okay. The other days I'm, I'm eating in these other ways that maybe aren't so good for me or the planet or these animals, but I've taken a step in the direction of, of let's say in the direction of love and care and empathy and, and interconnection, right? For other people, I mean, what you're describing sounds like, I think an ideal, I mean, if you could sort of snap your fingers and most people in the United States just sort of switched the way that they were eating. I think I would snap to what you're describing, not even necessarily where I'm at, because that's just what's real and nourishing and available for most people is, well, decrease your meat intake significantly. And to whatever degree you can be thoughtful about the source of the meat that you're eating, which again is not accessible to some of us, but some of us, maybe you do know that that meat is coming from if you live in a rural-ish area, you know that it's coming from that farm there. Well, what a wonderful way to stay connected with your local community and ecology and animals as well, right? Those are my thoughts, is that it's really much less about the all or nothing, which would tend to come with just the feelings of guilt and not feeling good, rather than take the steps you can and celebrate that. Celebrate that as an act of love, as an act of power, you know, on the part of you and the way that you're making a difference in the world. It's very confusing because I've read so much about how the reason why our brains are what they are is because man started eating meat and the protein made our brains develop and grow. And we wouldn't have been um, as intelligent or even here today if we didn't start eating meat. So it's it's really it's a topic that it's difficult to, to, to broach because I don't personally think that 
globally, especially people will just not eat meat ever again. I, I think it's, it's like, an, I think we'll solve poverty before that happens. <laughs> I, it's, I just don't think I hear that. Meat, yeah. It's more important to treat the animals that come in our path with love and kindness and, and take care of them and give them a wonderful life. I mean, definitely cut back on meat. Like I did. My daughter's a vegetarian. My sister's a vegetarian. I have a lot of yeah. people in my life that are, but it's challenging for some of us to just exit out yeah. of it. One of my closest friends, his wife only eats meat. Oh, wow. I love her dearly. And that is what she has found and feels she needs to do for her own health. I'm the last person who's going to just say everyone out there should just stop eating meat. We're all such different people. Yes. We're all in different places. But the research does seem to be pretty clear. I'm not going to, I'm being, I'm soft pedaling. I'm soft shoeing it rather. The research is very clear that generally eating less meat is much better for our personal health. And again, I think it's an opportunity for us to take what you're describing, the immediacy of that interaction with the animals that cross our paths, and to generalize that in a way to all these animals whose lives and suffering tends to be hidden from us by the, the people between us and them, right, who don't want us to know about that. So it's an yeah. opportunity to to move in that direction and channel our love and just that that feeling of interconnectedness in that other way as well, without just beating ourselves up about it or or just beating someone else up about it, right? Because that's not yeah, going to help either. Yeah, because vegans do that a lot. You know, they 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 go on the warpath sometimes. But but you were right what you said earlier in our conversation that people don't want to see it. Like I I know for me. If I see a video on a slaughterhouse, like I'll, I'll have a nervous breakdown. I yeah. can't, I can't yeah. handle it. I just yeah. can't. So for me, it's better to not look, you know, just do that kind of thing. I don't And I want that for you. It. Yeah. You should be gentle with yourself like that. I mean, that's what you and the world both need as long as we hold it in our consciousness as well. I think, you know, because yeah. it is so hidden generally yeah. that, you know, I think it's it's important to not forget. And maybe occasionally if there's a new undercover video, I let myself watch it. It's just a reminder that, oh my God, that's really what they're still doing in there, you, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but wow. that again, it's not about just subjecting ourselves to the violence of the world and, and taking that into right. ourselves necessarily either. Right. Well, you know, you get the same type of reaction when you see... Um, a video about child trafficking or something as heinous as that. So it's yeah. just, like I said, sometimes the whole global thing. And that's why I liked your book too, because it, it you know, after each chapter, I kind of sat with it and tried to think about what I just read and see how it resonated in me, you know, and I, I, I like doing yeah. that. That was I love really, that. thank you. I love that. And something I would encourage is that for anyone out there who is hearing about this, thinks maybe they want to check out the book, a lot of people have told me that the way that they really enjoyed the book is they don't necessarily just read it cover to cover, but they either just pick some of the chapter titles that really speak to them, or I know a few people, they just randomly open it before bed and read a few pages because it's like that, right? As you mentioned, each section just... Yes dives in a, in, in a whole different direction sometimes it comes together i think in a really important way but for some people just dropping in and reading those three pages and then never opening it again that might change their lives because they just read that one thing that's been waiting for them that they've needed to access that's or so hear true. right that's so, true. so like i know i'm going to reopen it again and i think i'm going to do that next time just kind of make it willing yeah. and pick a pick a, a section to read so in, yeah. in closing, because I could talk to you for hours, I think. <laughs> um, and I, I hope we can do this again in the future, because I still have a bunch of questions that we never got Let's to. Let's do it. That would be lovely. Definitely. Um, but what what are you what were you hoping to accomplish? And of course, I'm going to have your your courses running across the screen and in the description where folks can reach yeah. out to you. And I, yeah. I hope they leave questions in the comments and maybe you can. Maybe when we talk next, you yeah. can answer them. That would be great. Those, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but what were you hoping to accomplish with your book? What was what was your end game when when you wrote this book? Because it took you years, and I, yeah. I can see 
that so much thought and work went into it. I mean, yeah. I, I could see where it took you. Would it take 10 years or something? Yeah, over 10 years. Yeah, yeah. that's a long time. I mean, I know yeah. authors that wrote, write books in six months. Yeah. So what were yeah. you hoping to to gain by writing this book? What's your yeah. thesis statement about that? I'm going to answer that two ways, sort of baseline way. That is, in a sense, sort of like the the lowest possible, this is what it's going to be, is first of all, it was me following the path that I just felt was was meant for me. This is what I am meant to be doing. I live a very purposeful life, as I've already mentioned, a very felt life. And this felt more purposeful, like a, sort of a deeper calling than I think anything I've ever experienced. I mean, it would have to on some levels for me to stick with it for 10 years, right? So there's that level. Just I was doing what I was meant to be doing. And if nothing else came of it, that is, I think, a really important thing for all of us to try and tune into. Beyond that, it was incredibly rewarding that I got to spend 10 years meditating on and researching these kinds of topics, right? How to live well. And what have other people written about how to nourish our spirits and live generously and in gratitude in this time and place, right? So I told people, if only my grandmother reads this book, it'll have been worth it, you know? So on some basic level, there is that. What I would also say is that I think with anybody both just living their lives day to day, but also especially when you're applying yourself to do something that's about other people or making a difference. We should aim high and impact, have as much of an impact as we can. But it, I think the bottom line or so the lower level of, of the minimum of what we want to accomplish is to infuse it with love and beauty and good intentions so that no matter where it ends up or how it ends up impacting people, we know that we contributed to that that blossoming in that way. So minimally, that is what I was doing with this book was I created as beautiful and meaningful a work as I could so that whether anyone else ever read it or not, I knew that that had, was what I created, right? At the upper scale, I think that some of these fundamental ideas are vital at this time that we're living in. Highlighting that disconnect between money and possessions and well-being would make such a powerful difference for how many, so many of us are living our lives and the policies and economics of our society. We're at a time where we have to pay attention to these things. I mean, we're talking about potentially half of all the species on the planet disappearing by the end of the century right? A billion climate refugees. We have to grapple with these issues one way or the other. And I hope that through the thoroughness of my research and hopefully some of the spirit and love and how I present it really can move people and can be infused in our larger society as part of the way we think and move in the world and make decisions, right? And part of that is through these conversations. Absolutely. Part of it is through getting the book out there people themselves recommending the book, making sure it's available in libraries, things like that, trying to get it available in colleges, within classes, things like that, to just infuse it so that even at the same time, you have so many economics professors and business people over here just taking it for granted that more is better. And the whole game is about how do we get more and not get caught or minimize the damage we do to the planet, that there is an equally loud voice over here being discussed and felt and seen in social media and in shows that just is part of the culture of, and we also actually already know that that more is better thing is wrong and often backwards. So that those can start to be more in dialogue with each other and hopefully our society at large, but so many more individuals can just live the rich, beautiful lives that they're meant to live out from under the weight of so much of what is just being driven at us. I, I think we need that now more than ever, Jeff. That That is beautiful. Thank you so much for that explanation. And I, next time we talk, I, I want to hit the climate topic too, because that we can do a whole hour on easily. But I think it's so important yeah. for us to talk about that as well. Thank you so much for these questions. If you can't tell, I am passionate about these things and I love the opportunity to get to talk about them and share with people. So thank oh, you. I'm so glad we did. Thank you so much.